So can you tell me where you came from? Like, were you uh, in the U.S., China? Where did you come from? No, I'm originally a daughter of China, you know, and I was really born right into the Maoist revolution. And, uh, you know, that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I've had a very interesting life because I really came from a, you know, place of scarcity because after the revolution, there was really mass starvation and famine and, uh, you know, uh, whenever war and, and pestilence and revolutions occur, it's really, unfortunately, the common people who really have to suffer the most because, you know, there's a food scarcity afterwards and, you know, there's really uh, a new uh, world order, so to speak, you know, for the Chinese because you basically went from a, a, the, the nationalist uh, government um, headed by the Kuomintang to uh, Chairman Mao and, you know, uh, of course, he basically implemented the new modern China and uh, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the Maoists or the communists have done a really remarkable job of modernizing China, and it's really an incredible might and power now. And, uh, you know, I, I did business for about 20 years with, you know, my mother country because I would design the gowns that uh, I was very, became very famous for, uh, but I would have them manufactured in China because I really got to really implement all these beautiful old uh, age old couture methods that were formerly only available from the finest couture houses in Europe, uh, in France, and Italy, and the UK. And they would really cost about, you know, like $25,000 a gown. And whereas my gowns really looked like that they were really right up there, people were astonished to really find out that they were, you know, like a mere few hundred dollars with all that beautiful couture workmanship. So, you know, I sort of made my mark and I created a whole new look for the evening category. And I basically ruled that, uh, you know, uh, market for probably over a decade. And I sort of revolutionized the whole look. I was widely copied, you know, unfortunately, they eventually took my um, uh, designs and had them knocked off or copied in India for about, you know, a, a fraction of the price. Right. <laughs> and so, so, and then I saw that the um, face of retail was really changing. This, this was a, a little over three years ago. So I just really decided to, you know, keep my IP, my intellectual property, and to do other things with it. And by then, I basically really have had had a, you know, a 50-year career in fashion because I started out as a teen, teenager, basically. So anyway, uh, so I, I took, a, a, you know, um, a little bit of time off to really sort of um, contemplate what the next step creatively would be for me because I was basically a born artist and you know, uh, artists always have to create, you know, and you don't really have to really stay in one medium, uh, which I did for, you know, most of my uh, life. Um, but I was really basically a born artist. I'm, I'm what is known, I would say I would categorize myself as a, um, an inborn, uh, creative intuitive. In other words, the fields of knowledge and the wisdom that I hold creatively inside of me is really um, from within my soul. And it's, you know, if you really believe in the concept of past lives and, you know, reincarnation, then you might say that I really have had many lifetimes of creative practice, you know, over uh, the course of, uh, you know, many centuries or thousands of years or whatever, because I don't think people are just really born artists. They, they, they are born artists, but you know, it, it takes really um, the cultivation of many lifetimes to really perfect your art. And so, you know, there's really the concept of child prodigies, for instance. You know, for instance, how did Mozart become a composer? He started really composing by the time he was four years old. And there were very mature compositions at that age already. So that's basically how you would really explain um, a phenomenon so, so, such as uh, child prodigies, for instance. But getting back to, to my roots, I'm sorry, I digressed a little bit. It's perfect, I love it, it's great. But, but, but anyway, so I was born right into the revolution. My father had come to America as a uh, young man in uh, 1940. And uh, he, 
in the old days, you really b bought, you know, another man's identity to really come here. So, you know, the old time Chinese would just really come here, work hard for a number of years, and then they would go back, you know, to retire with a bundle of savings and money, and they would, you know, get married, and then some decided to stay in China with their new families. So my father bought one of these, you know, like uh, fake identities, and he came here. I mean, later on, he had a confession, of course, and he was allowed to stay. But anyway, so that was one year before, um, you know, the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. And, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, racial issues and discriminations going on in today's world. You know, I know, you know, the... Uh, the Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, movement has really gained a lot of momentum, but the more silent, you know, discrimination is really how basically Asians really have been attacked, you know, uh, since the COVID, um, you know, uh, pandemic broke out. And because, you know, there's a lot of ignorance in, in the world, unfortunately. So they think, they see, you know, an Asian person and they, you know, uh, they beat up on the, you know, Asian person or uh, they get discriminated again or yelled at or spat on or, you know, in the worst case, it was really this young family in, in, uh, in Texas that really got stabbed, including a two-year-old little baby, you know, I mean, and, you know, so uh, I actually started a petition, you know, um, to, uh, you know, for change, you know, to really protest these uh, violent attacks against Asians, because it kind of reminded me of the stories that my father used to tell me at the outbreak of Pearl, uh, Pearl Harbor, the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. And he told me that all Chinese had to really wear uh, signs or placards on, on, on the backs, you know, on their backs, uh, basically secured to their backs before they would really venture out into the streets, because otherwise, in the sign would say, you know, I'm Chinese, I'm not Japanese, because otherwise it would really be stoned or beaten up or, you know, spat at or, you know, egged or, you know, some form of perverse, um, you know, uh, discrimination or, you know, the, the hatred act of one uh, sort or other. So unfortunately, you know, the, the, the racism still persists, you know, but you know, I personally, you know, grew up in the ghetto. I, I, I grew up, you know, my first uh, home uh, after, you know, being thrown into a tenement building for, you know, for six months was really, you know, my father bought um, a, a, a family home for us for $11,000 back in those days. And, uh, you know, it was right in South Central LA. So I grew up in the ghetto. I grew up, uh, you know, with a, a mixture of blacks, uh, very few whites because they really had moved out by then, Hispanics, Asians, you know, and uh, we all got along, you know, so I don't really know what the big deal is, you know, I mean, you know, I think, you know, like um, everybody has a little bit of racism in them in one form or other, you know, so, you know, but I believe that, you know, we are really one great human race, and th so that's what I really advocate, you know. So I think instead of really stressing the um, differences, we should really talk about unity because we, we are all one. So that's what I like to really advocate, you know? And so instead of really talking about more uh, separ separatism and more divide and division, you know, let's really talk about something positive that unites the world instead of just really you know, th this great big divide, you know. I've always had friends of all ethnicities, uh, you know, in my life. When I, you know, do my catwalks on the runway, I use Latina, you know, Lat Latina models. I've used uh, black models. I've used Asian models. I've used uh, beautiful European models from Russia, from Czechoslovakia, from uh, Italy, from France. I mean, you know, so uh, and American models, of course, you know, some of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, models are also American homegrown girls. <laughs> so, you know, I like diversity in everything, you know, and, uh, you know, just like I love all kinds of music. You know, I, I like classical, I like jazz, I love blues, which is really, you know, a huge contribution, you know, from the, from the uh, black population. All that American, the roots of, of, of American music, you know, um, 
a lot of it, you know, jazz and blues is really, you know, from, from the black community. And then by the same token, you have country music, you know, and country music was really um, probably derived, you know, the, if you really go into the etymology of, of uh, country music, I'm talking about old style country, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, bluegrass, for instance, you know, there's a lot of difference. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of similarity between bluegrass and Irish country music, for instance. So that's what really makes this um, America such a great melting pot. And I think that's what really makes us really strong. And what really saddens me right now, and I wrote about it in Facebook and social media, is this whole racial divide. You know, so instead of really talking about division, let's talk about, let's celebrate our, you know, not our differences, you know, our differences, yes, you know, in, in our roots and where we come from. But, you know, we really have, you know, karmically gathered in this really, you know, wonderful place called America the Beautiful. And what's really like sad to me is really to see the dismantling and the disrespect, you know, given to our historical figures and our historical uh, statues. And, you know, they took down a, a statue of uh, Christopher Columbus. Well, I hate to say it, people, you know, if it weren't for Christopher Columbus, you know, discovering America, none of us would be here except for the Native Americans. So, you know, get real, you know what I mean? So it just, that sort of thing just really makes me sad. Yeah. So getting back, getting back to my roots now, sorry, I, I really got on my little soapbox and <laughs> digressed, but get, getting back to, to, to my uh, roots. So, you know, I, um, my father, you know, uh, went back to China um, after he spent about seven or eight years here and uh, he saved up enough money to really go back on a, you know, ocean liner uh, back to China, sell back to China. And he was set up by a series of um, matchmakers, you know, and, uh, and he reviewed some, you know, very lovely young ladies and decided my mother was the fairest one of all. So he decided to really marry my mother. And then uh, he stayed behind for about a year and she became pregnant with me and couldn't travel. So he heard that the Maoist army was really marching, you know, from the north to the south. And we're from uh, Guangdong, uh, the southernmost, you know, region in, in China. And uh, the capital used to be called Canton. That's the old name for, for the capital. Now, of course, it's called Guangzhou. And so I was really born in a very, very remote, almost medieval 16th century uh, village, you know, in China. So you look at who I am today and the roots of what I came from. I came from, you know, less than nothing. And yet I am the embodiment of the American dream. So all of those people who really feel, you know, dispossessed and that, you know, you can't get out of the ghetto. Well, I did. I got out of the ghetto. And I would say the first thing I would really recommend people is that they really have a sense of power and they have a dream, you know, and they pursue that dream. And the first order of things is get yourself an education because, you know, being educated and knowing the world and how it works and, you know, having intelligence to really deal with people, you know, there's two types of you know, uh, intelligence, uh, as you know, there's, you know, EQ and there's IQ. So EQ is basically, you know, your intelligence and how you interact with people, you know, uh, uh, that really determines whether you're going to have a successful uh, life or not, you know, because um, some people don't know how to deal with other people. They have too much pain. They have too much anger. They have too many issues. But you've got to really free yourself from all of that if you're going to really not block yourself in life, you know, and unblocking your, your life is really the root of, you know, per, uh, getting what you want in life, you know, being successful at pursuing your dreams. So anyway, I keep on digressing, but. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's great. So, so anyway, my, my father quickly fled, you know, uh, before the communists closed the whole doors. 
So they threw out all the foreign imperialists in their uh, uh, book. You know, that includes the Americans, the Brits, the French, the Germans. I mean, everybody got kicked out of China and China closed its doors. So, you know, I grew up in China, not ever having met my father with my mother, you know, uh, who was really in her young uh, 20s and my beloved little grandmother and there was starvation everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, the communists, you know, eventually took away our cooking utensils and we couldn't really um, cook anymore. So they, you know, commandeered our uh, Tower's Temple, which was in the front of the village. And, uh, you know, you would be rationed a bowl of rice with some vegetables at the end of the day. There was no meat, there was total scarcity. And that's all you got to eat for the whole day's worth of work. You know, so, you know, for to ensure my survival, my little grandmother would really chase rats around the house and pan fry them. And that's, you know, basically was my protein. Or my mother would really go out in the fields and she was really assigned, you know, uh, wood cutting because, you know, we didn't really have gas burners, you know, over there. You had to really fuel everything, you know, with, with firewood, including, you know, your, 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 your hearth or your, your kitchen. So it was very, very primitive and very, you know, medieval. You had to draw water from the well. There was no sanitation, no, uh, you know, uh, indoor plumbing or anything like that. You know, you had a chamber pot. And in the morning, you just really, you know, uh, put the receptacle in the communal outhouse, you know. So I was, you know, I grew up in very, very rural circumstances. So um, that was my life in China. And then, you know, when I was five and a half years old, um, my mother decided to take a leap of faith. And she uh, basically uh, had sewn into a little pillow all her wedding jewelry. And uh, so she bribed the border guard. Um, and gave uh, him all of her wedding jewelry. And we were met by um, relatives on the other side, which was Hong Kong. And so he released us to our freedom and they took us to safety. And I lived in Hong Kong with my mother for about a little over a year until my father petitioned for uh, me and my mother to come to America. So I came to America when I was six and a half years old and I met my father for the first time. So that was really quite something. <laughs> wow, that is an incredible story. Yeah. It's an incredible story, and uh, you know, so uh, you you might uh, want to ask, uh, you know, why I'm so driven towards success because you know, um, and it's instead of success, I think it's really more like a sense of accomplishment, but maybe success is really thrown in there. So you know, like the Chinese, you know, have uh, you know, they always covet you know um, boys, male male children. And my father was really vastly disappointed that he didn't really get number one son when I was born. So I became the first major disappointment in his life. So I think all of my life, I became this really overachiever uh, and you know everything was about accomplishment, accomplishment, success. So you know, I think I always really you know, wanted to please him and prove my worthiness to him. So, um, you know, and I, I really was thinking of going back to China and starting a, a second empire in China. But, you know, I just really said to myself, you know, at one point, you just really have to say to yourself, you've accomplished more, you know, probably three times more than anybody else would have in the same, under the same circumstances. At one point, you have to say, it's really enough and you've done enough and you have to really be happy with yourself because you know i live like a queen you know i've, I've been incredibly successful and um i'm still you know pursuing my um, creativity because once you're born an artist you never stop you never stop creating as an artist so i will be creative until i draw my last breath so um which really you know uh, makes me want to talk about you know, my legacy and uh, what the next steps will be, unless you have some other questions to, to ask me. I kind of just have like maybe one or two that I just personally wanted to know. Um, sure, yes. What do you consider being your big break whenever you started really pursuing your fashion career? Well, first of all, you know, if you really have a dream 
you have to really, you know, have the, 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 the um, mental and the spiritual uh, fortitude to really hold that vision in your third eye. So I'm going to get really close to you, but you see, I even have a physical third eye right there, you know, so that, you know, makes it really easy for me to be a visionary to really manifest, you know, my dreams. And that's how I create, that's how I design, and that's how, you know, it's, it's, it's the all-knowing eye. It's your eye of intuition. And it's really, you know, what gives you psychic, visionary um, powers or, or ability to really, you know, understand other people and really understand, you know, yourself and also have the ability to bring forth your dreams and make it a manifest reality. So that's what I've been really, really good at my entire life. And that's really how I approach creativity because, you know, people, you know, ask me, well, where do you get your ideas from? You know, I can't tell you that because, you know, the create the creative process is a divine process. You know, um, I don't know where it comes from, but I know that it comes from a divine source. It comes from the universe, and it just really speaks through me, if, if, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and then, you know, I, you know, often when I create something, I'm even surprised. And I said, wow, you know, I'm blown away. This is really cool, you know, <laughs> because, you know, like, I don't even know where I'm going to really start, but, you know, it starts and it's almost like automatic writing, you know, it just really translates and, and, you know, ideas come to me and it's from the either. It really is, you know, from the either. So it's a mysterious force. It's a, you know, um, it, it's, it's a great, you know, thing to have. And I think, you know, being a born artist is really the greatest gift that I could have been given in this lifetime, you know? And I think I'll always have it in all of my incarnations and in all of my future lifetimes as well, because it's something that you really earn as a discipline for many, many different lifetimes. So uh, getting back to the big break, um, you could say that, okay, so I grew up pressing shirts in my uh, parents' Chinese laundry until about, you know, midnight or past every single day. I was really, you know, uh, expected to, to really work. And, you know, my parents were, you know, struggling immigrants. And, uh, you know, so eventually they moved from the ghetto. They moved us into, you know, basically white suburbia, which was Culver City back in those days. You know, that's where MGM Studios, uh, you know, was uh, and still is. And uh, so, you know, my father finally saved up enough money to really, you know, buy a, a small piece of land. And he was able to really build his own building. I think it cost him $25,000 or something at the time. This was really the early 60s and so you know the downstairs was a Chinese hand laundry and dry cleaning uh, business that my parents had and then upstairs was really our um, you know uh, apartment where you know uh, we lived uh, where I lived with my parents and my two brothers who were born after me in America and, uh, you know, it's really sad. You know, it was really sad for, for, for my um, mother, especially, you know, uh, because she had to really witness the deaths of my two younger brothers. So, you know, um, I've had a lot of tragedies in life. I've had a lot of loss. I've had, you know, terrible men, men you know, steal money from me you know, <laughs> and bankrupted me even. But, you know, to me, life is really one unending lesson and the fates will really throw obstacle courses at you all the time. And the test is how you deal with these obstacles that really make you into a stronger human being. So I'm sorry to digress again, but I'll go back to your question. So basically when I was 16 years old, up to the time that I was, you know, 16 years old, I was really helping, um, 
uh, you know, my, my parents um, in their Chinese laundry, uh, sorting out dirty laundry, wrapping packages, you know, um, pressing shirts. And I was expected to do that. And then when I was 16 years old, I was chosen, um, you know, one of two girls to really represent my student body. And, you know, we had about over 300 girls in, in my uh, graduating class. And so I was chosen by uh, the May Company, which was a really major department store back in those days, to be on their, uh, you know, uh, high deb or teen board. And so I got my start in fashion there. We did uh, displays. We uh, modeled in the uh, tea room. You know, they had a lunch room where ladies, you know, came and had lunch. And, you know, we uh, took things off the floor and did a little fashion show at, uh, in the tea room. And then we would also really sell on the uh, floor. So, you know, that's basically how I got my um, start. And it was really the height of Twiggy and, you know, the mod era, you know, Carnaby Street. Uh, you know, it was all that psychedelic, you know, uh, rock uh, stuff. Actually, it was even before then. It was really, you know, uh, you're too young to remember, but m maybe you heard of British Invasion. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you, all the British in inv in Invasion, starting with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, by the way, you know, and you had all these other groups, Hermans, Hermits, Peter and Gordon, and, you know, so on and so forth, the, the Birds, the Yarbirds, you know, the uh, Cream, all of that. So anyway, so, so that was really, you know, my coming of age. And uh, then I, um, my uh, parents would not really support my art education because originally I wanted to become an artist and a painter. And, uh, you know, that really is a tantamount for them to really be a beggar, you know. <laughs> so they uh, refused to, um, you know, subsidize my uh, art education. And then, uh, so I went into fashion as a sideline, and it proved to be a really great career for me. Um, you know, I'm the really sort of multi-dimensional um, uh, creative who can really excel at many different things, you know, um, including interior design. I mean, you know, anything of the visual arts I'm very good at, you know. I also like to write, and I'm, you know, currently writing my autobiography and working on uh, the, the script for, for, for my movie because I'm doing a biopic, you know, because I think I really have had this sort of life that it can be an inspiration for you know many people because it's it's a story about um you know it's a sort of a shakespearean you know uh, a story of uh tragedy and betrayal and you know uh greed and glamour and money and success and all of that stuff but it had all that those other dark elements and it basically, you know, is a story ultimately about the triumph of the human spirit, you know, basically that you can really overcome your adversities, you know, like I said, you know, slings and arrows, you know, to really borrow from Shakespeare can really point at you. But how do you really handle those situations, you know, and I just really uh, saw them as tests of spirit, you know, uh, it's uh, like, um, you know, the gods throw you hoops and you have to really jump over it and overcome adversity to really conquer it and to really free yourself. And also to emerge, you know, without bitterness. Because I think, you know, like a lot of people have bitterness and they have pain and they can't let it go. You know, they get angry and the toxicity just really eats at your soul and it becomes a poison and it holds you back. And I never allow that to happen to me. I've made two huge fortunes in my life. I was successful at a very young age. By the time I was 25, I accomplished my first American dream. You know, I was making millions of dollars a year. I had four homes, including two mansions side by side in, Ma in uh, Malibu by the time I was 25 a home on the ocean front in Hawaii, you know, a home in the Hollywood Hills. And I was jet setting on the Concorde going to London and Paris. And, you know, I was really living the dream by the time I was 25. And um, it all came crashing down on me and I lost everything, you know, 
when I was 30. And then I had to really climb back up the mountain. And, you know, in my youthful arrogance, I thought it would just really take me two minutes to get everything back. And the gods decided to teach me a lesson of humility. And instead of two minutes, it took me 20 years. <laughs> But, uh, and then, you know, like I had it all stolen, you know, from me uh, by con artists and that sort of thing. So, you know, like uh, I had to start all over again, you know, and uh, so, you know, life will present hard heading uh, lessons. But um, this time, you know, I, I think the kind the, the gods were much kinder and I rebuilt my, my life again within 10 years. And uh, I'm at a very good place right now. So, uh, and I'm just really ready to embark on the new chapter. Please, please discuss if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Well, you know, so, so basically, you know, for about five decades, I was a celebrated fashion designer. And uh, my clothes were in 27 different countries. Um, I had a really, you know, uh, smaller but exquisite brand that was very, very well recognized and, and uh, well respected. I sold to all the big, you know, major players such as um, Neiman Marcus was my number one customer and followed by Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, Lord & Taylor, you name it, you know, and every mom and pop, you know, better boutique across America, as well as, you know, the Middle East, you know, Europe, uh, Asia, Japan, um, Malaysia, you know, I was really all over the world. So I, I was doing that for, you know, five decades. And like I said, it was a really great profession for a girl. And then also I was really, you know, like the, the sole breadwinner and I was taking care of everybody. I was taking care of my parents, my, my, my brother, uh, after we lost my, my first brother. And, uh, you know, I had two sons to raise, you know, and uh, unfortunately I had a husband, you know, who was... Uh, uh, mentally ill, you might say, as much as I loved him. And, um, you know, we got divorced eventually. And uh, so I had a family to support, even though I could have really gone and done so many other creative things. I decided to stick with fashion because I was really good at what I did. And, um, you know, I became very proficient at it. But, you know, so now, you know, after all this time, I became a master at my craft. So you, you, you might say I have a PhD in fashion, even though I really basically didn't study fashion except for about for three months at LA Trade Tech. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I uh, got very famous about 20 years ago for my evening uh, wear. And I basically ruled that market for, you know, about 12 years as the number one resource. And, uh, you know, I never had designed evening wear before, but I'm the type of, you know, uh, creative intuitive like I said that you know I, I, I just really got it like that and I taught myself how to really design evening wear within one season which is the equivalent of two months by the way because there's oh, like wow. you know a little bit over two months you know maybe two and a half months because we in the American market have five seasons a year so five seasons a year as a you know creative uh, fashion designer you basically had to really stand naked in front of your, you know, creativity again, and whatever you did didn't even count anymore. So you had to really redefine yourself every two and a half months. <laughs> so that was really a lot of deadlines, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, you know, and I basically, you know, did so many decades of that. And I only in all those years set out two seasons in my entire life. So you can imagine the productivity that I put out for the companies that I work for, which were only three companies. The rest of those years, 32 years, I was really, you know, in my own business because I was my own sole uh, creative uh, designer. I was the only designer. I designed everything. And then, you know, I would do about 300 uh, designs a, a, a year times a five so you could just really do the math that was about 1500 designs a year and then you know, my, my collections would really go to a market and my buyers you know of the, the of the stores would say gee how many designers does sue have working for her 
<laughs> my representatives would would say, well, she's the only one. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. But, you know, I'm, I'm very, very prolific. You know, I'm very, very fast, you know. Um, I don't really want to brag, but in one day, I think my record for really conceptualization of designs was 76 gowns in one day, you know, so. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a lot. I'm very, very fast because, you know, is this visionary third eye that I have and it just facilitates everything, you know, and I make split second decisions all the time. So it was a great career for me, but I just really saw the direction of retail basically three years ago. I had at least a vision to really see, uh, you know, um, uh, what was really coming on. And it basically was the death of retail. You can really see, you know, Macy's just, you know, is closing 800 stores. Um, Neiman Marcus is in bankruptcy. I mean, this one is closing, that one is closing. So I decided to keep, oh, you have a little friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I decided to, you know, keep my IP and, you know, uh, for the time being, you know, get out of fashion. I decided to give myself a three-year break because I'd never really taken off in my, excuse me, entire life. You know, basically I worked through my pregnancies and I remember going into the uh, ambulance, you know, to uh, give birth. And I was still handing sketches out to my assistants in the ambulance. <laughs> and then after the, the childbirth, I would really come home and I'd be convalescing in my bedroom and my, uh, you know, uh, pattern makers and drapers would really roll the mannequin, you know, because you know, I required that my assistants in order to really interpret the pattern, the designs and make the pattern, they would really drape the, the, the design in muslin first. So they would really, you know, uh, uh, roll the, the, the uh, mannequins, um, you know, uh, with the muslin into my master bedroom while I was in bed you know, getting approval on the proportions. So I just didn't skip a beat. So I just really decided, okay, it's time out. And I really need to, um, you know, take a break here for the first time in, you know, um, basically uh, half a century. <laughs> so I, I took some time off and then I just really sort of pondered what my next creative move would be. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, you know, I uh, just bought this really fabulous uh, mansion. You know, um, I already have a fabulous mansion in the same neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood is called Los Feliz and it's really the uh, old Hollywood Hills East. So, you know, Los Feliz is, you know, uh, the place where you have all these fabulous uh, mansions from the 1920s. And this is where like Cecil B. DeMille lived and Charlie Chaplin and Gary Cooper and, you know, um, uh, Bogey and Bo uh, Bacall and all of the, these people, they, they used to really live in these really hills of Hollywood. Uh oh, I lost, I, I lost her. Freya? Oh, can you see me? I can't see you, but, um, I can, you know. Oh, you're good. Can you I can see, see you? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll keep on going. I can't see you anymore, but it's okay. Um, so anyway, uh, so the, they, they uh, lived here in the Hollywood Hills and the Cecil B. De, uh, DeMille Mansion was just bought by uh, Angelina Jolie a couple of years ago for $25 million. And um, I own probably the Grand Dame of that whole era. And the name of my estate is really called the Cedars, also known as the Norma Talmadge Mansion. And Norma Talmadge was a preeminent movie star of uh, the 1920s. And she lived here uh, with her husband, uh, Joseph Schenck. I don't know whether you ever saw the classic movie uh, by uh, Billy Wilder called Sunset Boulevard. Did you, do you ever uh, remember that movie? Yes, I do. All right, that was a you know, movie where she is sauntered down the stairs you know, at the end and she says, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close up. Remember that line? So that came, that came from Sunset Boulevard. Uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, made in part at my mansion, the Cedars, you know. And then another, you know, famous movie got made there 
Well, there were other two. There, there was Jane Eyre. And then in the uh, late 60s, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda made uh, Easy Rider. So, you know, all of the New Orleans scenes were basically filmed here uh, between the foyer, the library, and the, the grand um, salon or ballroom with the gilded gold colonnades right here at the Cedars. So let me tell you a little bit about the Cedars. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Are we okay? Um, we're at 45 minutes, so. Oh so should I uh, uh, talk about this some other time? Oh, no, we can, I mean, if you, if you have about, you know, 10 minutes to finish, I, I would love to hear it. Yeah, okay, all right, great. So the, anyway, so the Cedars was the visionary uh, creation of, of, uh, of an artist, of a French artist who came over here in the teens, you know, to make films. And his name was Maurice Tunier. And he uh, was a, a screenwriter as well as a movie director for MGM Studios. So, you know, perched on uh, three of my six fireplaces, you have the uh, iconic, emblematic uh, MGM uh, lion, which is all gilded. And it's just really gorgeous. I wish, it, you know, uh, I had thought about it, but I would have bought my book and then I would have shown some of your people uh, photos of the Cedars. But anyway, so um, uh, the Cedars became his, um, you know, glorious creation. And uh, he made the original, um, you know, um, The Last of the Mohicans, the black and white uh, silent version, by the way. And uh, so before it was finished, he decided to sell the Cedars because he had a tip with the, the uh, MGM bosses and his wife in Paris was threatening to divorce him. So he quickly sold the, the estate to the Hellman banking family. And it was, it was an, um, originally on 15 acres of, uh, you know, the, these uh, beautiful grounds with cascading fountains and terrace gardens. And there was a lake at the bottom of the hill and the original gates open way, you know, in the distance in uh, down the hill on Los Feliz Boulevard. But over the years, sadly, it got, you know, uh, 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 sold, you know, the, a lot of the land got sold. But I have a three house compound here. So it's probably one of the, it, it might be the most famous house in Hollywood because it's no ordinary house. It's a, um, it's a palace and it's also a museum. You know, and speaking of a museum, you know, as part of my enduring legacy, um, I'm starting the Su Wong Legacy Foundation. And one of my gifts to the world will be to bequeath this really glorious house and turn it into a living museum, um, you know, as, as part of my legacy foundation. And I also, you know, want to start an adjunct museum and uh, the Su Wong Fashion Museum because basically I have archived over 11,000 of my favorite, favorite gowns and they're just all glorious and gorgeous and everything else. So that will be an adjunct museum, fashion museum. And uh, so that's another project that I'm working on in addition to, to my uh, film and, and my autobiography. But anyway, uh, getting back to the Cedars, this will be the inspiration for a um, mansion that I just really uh, bought really in the 1928 Hacienda Manor. And so it will be the first of uh, branded homes from uh, the Su Wong designer signature collection. So I'm basically restoring a um, 1928 classic Spanish Hacienda on uh, 0.35 of an acre with you know gorgeous gardens and I'm putting in gazebos and beautiful cactus gardens and waterfalls and uh, you know just restoring it with beautiful period tile work uh, you know with uh, uh, Malibu tiles you know and um, terracotta tiles as well as uh, you know uh, recreating beautiful period iron work of that period uh, stain and leaded glass it's going to be really gorgeous I'm very excited about it and we just really came from the house right now uh, you know my cohort uh, Freya Pruitt and I and uh, so we're going to have all kinds of fun. It should probably be ready in about three months. And then I'll have an unveiling uh, party for the press and, you know, uh, for uh, some, some of my Hollywood uh, high profile friends. So that should be a lot of fun. 
So, you know, that's what I'm doing in addition to writing my, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing that, you know, uh, you know, hopefully this will eventually lead to Suwong Boutique Hotels as well, because if I hadn't really been a fashion designer in life, I definitely would have been an interior designer. So I've d designed, you know, all of my three homes. I have three homes that I live in. Uh, besides the Cedars, I have my beautiful Malibu uh, contemporary ultra modern um, uh, home uh, at the beach with a stunning modern art collection that I've been collecting for about 38 years. And then I have a spiritual sanctuary on the island of Maui in this very beautiful, pristine uh, rainforest. And all three homes I basically designed, my corporate offices I designed. So, you know, um, creativity is fun for me. It's, it's never work, it's always play. It's the business aspect of it that is really kind of more uh, drudgery, but you know, you deal with it and you can have, uh, you can be a creative businesswoman as well. So that's what I'm working on. So <laughs> it's, it's very exciting and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but you know, it's really rewarding because to me, to really, you know, have a creative life, like I said before, is the biggest blessing that anybody can really wish for. And, uh, you know, so I feel very honored and very privileged that I can really share my art, you know, with the world for so many decades and hopefully, you know, for decades more to come. Oh, my goodness. You are so inspiring. Thank you, Thank you. so much for sharing that with me. Thank you. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, an old soul. And even though biologically I'm older, I probably have the energy of somebody who's 30 years old still. <laughs> Well, you look incredible, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I feel really great, you know, and uh, fortunately, I had really good genes. Um, my father uh, passed away when he was 77 years old. He didn't have one uh, wrinkle, hardly, hardly any uh, gray hair, and uh, he would have really probably lived to 100 if he hadn't really smoked like two packs a day of cigarettes. So the nicotine really, you know, killed him, unfortunately. Tobacco is a very bad thing. Oh, I hate to hear that. Yes, and I live a very clean lifestyle, you know. Um, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, haven't really done any of that my entire life. And I think that's why I look as, you know, well as I do. And uh, that's why I have, you know, this sort of um, unsurmountable amount of energy because being creative really helps because when you're creative, you know, you really create this really marvelous article of beauty you send it out into the universe, and the universe really gives you twice fold back the energy. So I think that's what really keeps me youthful uh, as well. That's awesome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with me today. Well, you're, you're very welcome. I hope I didn't talk your head off. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved everything you said. You're so inspiring, and I think well, a lot of you. people will take something from this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honestly, I hope we can talk in the future, and I would love to see your museum and everything unfold. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have uh, Jimmy and Eileen, my publicist, get in touch with you, um, and maybe you can even fly out for, for the, uh, you know, uh, opening party of, of uh, the, the, the new um, mansion, which I really have uh, renamed Villa Felice. That sounds incredible. I would definitely love that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Tristan, for really having me. So it's really been a great pleasure. And um, we'll talk again soon. We will enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Have a good one. You too.